Come on, let's give God a praise. Let's give him a praise. You can do better than that. Give him a praise. As we stand, would you worship with us this morning and give honor and praise to God this morning as we give him praise and worship him. God is so great. He's on the throne and he reigns. Reigns in our lives. The skies proclaim, God, you reign. Your glory shines. You tease the sun when to bring a new day. Creation sings, God, you reign. Come on, help me on this chorus. God, you reign. God, you reign. Forever and ever. God, you Alone, my hope is found. He is 
is my life, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my confidence. worship him today. Come on. Sing this next verse. In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God and endless faith, this gift of love, righteousness, sworn by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of was satisfied for every sin was laid here in the death of Christ I live let me sing this next verse In glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost his grip on me, I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Sing this with me. No guilt and life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From my first cry to final threat, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Stayed, he was still 
white as snow. For nothing good I have, whereby thy courage to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land. Jesus, come on, sing. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin and left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne. My soul to say, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He was it white as just us without the music. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Hallelujah. Let's love on the Lord a little bit. worship him to worship you oh my soul rejoice take joy my king in what you hear let it be a sweet praise like you've never given one. Come on, give him a praise. Give him a praise. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Doc. Just as a reminder, if you have an interest in learning more about our church or if you're ready to join, we have a membership class following this service in the fellowship hall. So when we're done, go on in there. We get cranked up around noon. We have lunch 
uh, as an incentive for those that would not be able to make it, which is me, uh, come in and eat with us, and then we'll go through some things that let you know about our church. If you've already joined, you may not come and eat with us. Um, it's only for the new pokes. It's kind of like a, a telephone, you know, if you have a cell phone. This is only for new subscribers here to come in. All right, but uh, keep that in mind. It, it will be very helpful. And I also trust that you read the other stuff in the bulletin so I don't have to go over all of that. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege belonging to you and all that goes with that. Father, we realize that it's not just giving us a, a label, some title that we can carry around to, to tell others that, yes, we, we belong to you, but there's a life that goes with that title that demonstrates that you are a great God. And you give us the privilege of living that life in a way that, that can either convict others that their life is going the wrong direction or it could inspire them that there is a life they could be drawn to. So God, we, we ask you to use our lives as testimonies to you. And Father, also use our voices as it can become appropriate for us to share with others the hope that's in us. So, Father, thank you for that. Bless our new ministry of tracks where we can give out little pamphlets that might help people understand what they need to understand about knowing you. So, Father, bless that as well. We thank you also for getting the, the, uh, the student connection ministry going. Uh, Lord, in the, in the past couple of weeks, and Father, thank you for what you're going to do because of that. Lives that are going to be changed, homes that are going to be restored, simply because of the work that goes on here with our students, Father. Thank you for how you love us and protect us. Thank you for those who are able to be back, who have been gone for so long. Thank you for those who will be here as soon as they get uh, vaccination, a few other things that they need taken care of. Father, thank you that you are providing for us a good, safe place to come and worship you. So bless this day and all that we do in Jesus' name. Now, one thing I, I want to point out, because I don't know if all of you know this family. Randy, would you and uh, Erica, I'm sorry I went blank, stand up for just a second. All right, everybody turn and look at them. All right, all right, thank you. Th these are the leaders who are helping us develop our new student ministry. They, they have been a part of our church in the past in different varying ways. Uh, Margaret over there is Erica's mom, so there's the connection with that. You know the, the heritage that, that they come out of. Uh, but I just want you to kind of know that that's who's helping do this, so you know how to pray and who to pray for. So keep, keep that in mind as it goes on, all right? You know, last week we left off and Jacob, his 12 sons and their families were headed into Egypt. Remember the drought? Remember the things that called them to go there and buy grain because that was the only place they could get food? And so they went and ended up staying for some 400 years. Now, they stayed there and remained there until Exodus 1 verse 7 the sons of Israel were fruitful, increased greatly, and multiplied, and became exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who didn't know Joseph, and said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let's deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So it sounds like we're going to have to figure out some way in some benevolent system to keep them happy and keep them here as a part of our land. Look at what they did. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. Uh, that's not the way to make friends. It's not the way to keep a group of people happy and satisfied. So their objective of how they thought they needed to treat these people was totally contrary to what their heart seemed to indicate was the reason they wanted them to stay there. Now, when the conditions of their lives changed, the Bible says they cried out to God. 
And in crying out to God, God created the probably the, the most uh, um, significant deliverance in the lives of the Jews. In fact, that is sort of the foundation of much of their teaching. They keep going back to that, referring back to their time in slavery and God's deliverance. Uh, they actually uh, established, God did, the Feast of Passover, which they celebrate every year, which is a reminder of the last night they were slaves. And when the death angel passed over their houses and took out the firstborn of all the families in Egypt, they were spared. And so they established Passover to celebrate that. Well, they were no longer long-term guests, but now they were slaves. Now, this is in general. Whenever we want to uh, understand the inner workings of the stories of the Bible, we have to be careful where the Bible is silent. Uh, you'll find there's a really a lot of interesting uh, uh, opinions or, or interesting projections that people will make on the Bible when the Bible is silent, doesn't say anything at all. They've got to fill in the blank somewhere, and so they kind of devise uh, things that they think should have happened that the Bible just left out. For example, most of our imagery of the Exodus is based on the imagination of producers of the movie Ten Commandments. When I read it, I'm seeing Charlton Heston. You know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing all of these things that went on because that's the imagery that's in my mind and, and it, it, it taints it somewhat. A more modern version of that is the Prince of Egypt that, that Disney did. Uh, younger families, if you have kids or grandkids, you've seen that because you have to watch it along with them. Both of those stories, though, project an image of the Jews that I don't think is really consistent with what's going on. Now, again, there's a, an enormous number of people that are involved in this exodus. We don't really know the whole number. It's never been able to be calculated out to be specific and accurate, but it's a bunch of people. But within that bunch of people... There were some who were not spiritually motivated for this trip to go out of Egypt and into this promised land. They, they were wanting freedom out of slavery, but they didn't know that they were signing up for a transformed life that was going to change them into a people that's different than what they were in Egypt. They were sort of going for their own ulterior motives and not following through on, on what God was going to be doing with them. You realize they had lived 400 years in a pagan land. E Egyptians had a God for everything. And you can imagine how that would rub off on you if you weren't really strongly convicted or convinced that you were right in everything you believed. Because remember, they had no scripture then. They, they had no temple, they had no system of worship, they had no sacrifice. They had none of the things that we read about them later acquiring after they go through the, the time in the, in the wilderness. But at this point in their history, they had nothing. They just had a family connection and maybe some traditions that had been passed down over these years. They really had no structure to their life. What did they have? They had a promise. Now, if you can go back with me in, in the story, you'll remember that God promised he was going to make a nation of them and give them a place to live. That, that was sort of what was built into this because that promise goes all the way back to Abraham when God pulled him out of, of Ur of the Chaldeans, this pagan land, and brought him into this promised land and basically said, okay, Abraham, you're my guy. I'm going to create from you a nation. And that nation is going to absorb this land and live here. And the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. It was that defining moment in Abraham's life when he said, God, I believe you're going to do what you say. I'm in. I give you my life to what you want to accomplish through me. Then, Abraham had that son of promise, Isaac, 
And then God met with Isaac and told him, I'm going to run this thread through you. Genesis 26, 24. The Lord appeared to Isaac uh, the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I'm with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So Isaac built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord. So here, here was Abraham's faith to believe what God was going to do, now being handed over to his son, but his son could not live based upon what his father believed. God had to become real to him. And so in this moment, God said, okay, Isaac, here I am. I'm going to do the same thing with you that I told your father I was going to do. And Isaac said, I'm in. I, I declare you are my God, and I'm in for your purposes. Then you'll remember that Isaac had a son. He had actually twins, but one of those sons was Jacob. Jacob was the one who had the 12 sons. Each one of them became a tribe of this nation of Israel. Jacob had his moment with the Lord. Genesis 28, 13. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth and will spread out to the west and east and north and south. And in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob makes his own confession that, God, I'm in. I buy. I believe I'm now part of what you're wanting to do. So here's, here's the, trans, the, the, the uh, transition. Abraham met with God. God met with him and gave him the promise. God then met with Isaac and gave him the same promise. God then met with Jacob and gave him the same promise. Jacob was not living based upon Isaac's promise. Isaac was not living based upon his father's promise. All three of them were the foundation of the promise. Now that becomes crucial when we think in terms of our families, that our kids often will copy our beliefs and our system and what we have practiced and how we do church. What they have to do is they have to come to a moment when they say, oh, you know what? God, I'm in. Not based upon what my parents believed, but I'm in because I believe and I submit myself to you. It is is making the promise personal to them and passing that on on down. What the Jews of the Exodus had was a heritage uh, of God's promise passed to them from their ancestors. And it was basically all that held them together is we have a promise. They had no instruction about how to live in light of that promise. They basically just had the promise and most of their minds and directed toward God had to do with that promise. You'll find that they referred to him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Very rarely do you find them saying, my God, our God. It was always looking back that the promise was what connected them with God. And you'll see how that has to change in just a few minutes. So when when Moses led them out of Egypt, it became clear he had a multitude of people who simply wanted freedom with no idea of how to live within that freedom. They wanted out, but they didn't really know what they wanted in two. They were kind of caught in that mid, mid ground. So they had to, uh, Moses had to reshape their identity. God through Moses speaking to them, telling them what he expected was intended to reshape who they were and how they thought so that they then could act uh, according to this new instruction. They had a mixture of paganism and a limited understanding of God. Now you ask, okay, how do you know that? Uh, you know, are you speaking in the, in the places the Bible doesn't tell you that? What's going on? No, you have to realize what happened just a very short time after they left Egypt. Okay, this, this is in Exodus 32, 8. Right after they had left Egypt, they went through a tragic moment 
But this tragic moment happened in a process of time, a sequence of time. Moses brought down the Ten Commandments, and the people were worshiping a golden calf instead of God. Here's what God said to Moses, Exodus 32, 8. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, when, when did that happen in the storyline? Now, again, forget the movie. Let, let's go to the storyline of the Bible. When did that moment, Moses comes down carrying the Ten Commandments, Havoc is wrecking the, the people, they're worshiping this calf. When did that happen? Did, did it possibly happen before they knew better? Or had they already been told not to do that? Look at that reference. See that Exodus 32? Open your Bible to Exodus 19. If you don't have one, there could be one in the, in the rack in front of you right there. Exodus 19, we're going back in time, several chapters, about 13 chapters, to get back here to find out what had happened before that moment had occurred. Look at Exodus 19, 1. In the third month, after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day... They came into the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, they had escaped captivity. They had gone through the Red Sea. They had traveled down through the desert. And now they had arrived at Mount Sinai and made camp. They had settled in there. Then, Exodus 19.3, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, verse 5, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. He's telling Moses to go down and tell them these things. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before him all the words which the Lord had commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. Now, wait a second. You, you realize this is before the calf. This was back in time, maybe, maybe a month or two before that ever happened. That God had already began to set down instructions to tell them he wanted them committed to him and no longer committed to Egypt. And what did they say? Yep, we're in. We agree. We, we will do that. Uh, all the people told God that they would do whatever he tells them to do. As a sign of their singular devotion to him alone and surrender of their lives and future to obey him. Now, again, you may think, wait, wait, I thought when they got there to the mountain, Moses went up, first thing, God gave him the Ten Commandments, he came down, and everything was going crazy. No, Mount Sinai experience was a conversation with God. It, it wasn't a just go up, get it, come back down. God called Moses back and forth. They would, he would come down and share what God had said. He would go back up on the mountain, listen to God, go down and share what God had said. It was a conversation between God, Moses, and the people. And it went on like that for an extended period of time. Uh, in fact, you might find this interesting that the first speaking of the Ten Commandments to the people was by God himself. Look at this, Exodus 19, verse 24. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down and then come up again, you and Aaron with you. Don't let the priests or the people come up. So Moses went down to the people and told them to gather at the base of, of, this, of this mountain. Verse 20, chapter 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all of these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth or beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. And then he went on to give the Ten Commandments. But the people said, we don't understand him. It sounds like thunder. It sounds like trumpets. We can't understand the words of God. So why would God speak to all these people when he knew they weren't going to understand what he was saying. It was simply because he wanted them to hear his voice and know that I am here speaking, and when I speak to Moses and he then speaks to you, it's me speaking through him. So that the authority that Moses could come down and say, this is what God said, would be established because God was the one saying it. He simply wanted them to know I'm involved in this, and I'm bringing this down to you myself. Jesus experienced a, a very similar moment with the Pharisees. In John 8, 43, he said, Why do you not understand what I'm saying? Is it because you cannot hear my word? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. Why couldn't the Pharisees understand what Jesus was saying? They could hear the words they could understand the language, but they couldn't get the meaning of what he was saying. It's because to them, he was just a man speaking man's words. They had no confidence that what his words were were the authority of God speaking through him to command their lives. They rejected him as just a man doing his own thing. And you realize when he said this... Uh, they probably, and I don't mean probably, they, they had never heard the voice of God before. So they didn't know they could recognize God's voice through Jesus. And he had said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And to them, he would say, that means you're not one of my sheep if you don't understand what I'm talking about. So, and so there was some similarity in that. And that moment with Moses, God, and the people, that the people were not yet God's people. They were the people of the promise, but they hadn't made that transition over yet to be God's people surrendering their lives to him and made that connection. So Moses had to be a go-between. Now here's for us, when we read our Bible, do we understand we are listening to the voice of God? through the pages of our scripture, by what's been written there. We're not listening to the opinions of men writing things about God. We're listening to God speaking through those men to tell us things about himself. It's crucial that you know what this book is and where it comes from, and not take it so casually that we can read it or not, we can study it or not. No, this is the voice of God speaking to us through his words. Kid, little kid was out calling in the big kids at the end of the day and, and, and said to them, it's time to come in. And they ignored him and told him to go away. And then he added those magic words, mama said, and everybody came. When we read the Bible, we, we read it with the equivalent of mama said, realizing it is God said, these things to us, and it has that power. Okay, Moses then goes back onto the mountain, and Exodus 20, 22, the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You should not make any other gods beside me, gods of silver, gold. And he goes on to express that. What's God doing? He's coming back around to make sure his spokesman, Moses, has the words that he wants communicated to the people. So he's coming back in again to say to Moses, make sure the people know what they heard was my voice, but here's what I was saying so that they'll know where that's coming from. Then, uh, chapter 24, verse 1, he then said to Moses, after Moses came back down and, and did that, went back up, he said, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone shall come up to the Lord, and they shall not come near, nor shall the people come with him. 
Then Moses came down, recounted to the people all the words of the Lord in his ordinances, all that the people answered with one voice and said, all of the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient. What God said we will do. We affirm the words spoken are his words. We will confirm that what he says is how we live. Now, is there an equivalent moment for us like that? A, a moment where we realize what God has said has bearing upon how I live. A, a moment that is a crucial decision when we choose to live biblically. I, I'm, I've, I've been living all of my life. Have I really been living in a way that reflects I believe the truth of this word. I belong to God. I want God's truth to transform me into the kind of person that reflects him wherever I go. Am I living biblically? Um, it's when we decide that adjusting our lives to the, to the words of the Lord will be the basis of who we are and how we live. Jesus said to Satan, actually, Matthew 4, 4, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. David had that same idea when he said in 119, 116, sustain me according to your word that I may live. The life of God within us is fed by the words of God that sustain us. See, we know, we know what it means to eat a good nutritious lunch, dinner, breakfast, we know how to feed our bodies to keep them healthy. What about our spirit? What about us as a child of God? What sustains us? What nourishes us? And it comes back to the Word of God. Reading that and, in, and, and investing in that by letting that be ingrained in our life begins to transform us into what we're supposed to look like. Jesus told his disciples in John 15, 8, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. What is fruit? Uh, the imagery just kind of throws us because we, we, we don't deal with produce connecting that with our spiritual life. But if we understand the process, the fruit is the evidence of the life of the tree. The tree is doing what it's designed to do. If it is an apple tree, apples should come off of it. If it is an orange tree, oranges should come off of it. It's doing what it's designed to do. Our fruit is the byproduct of our life, the evidence we belong to the Lord. It's the evidence that the life that flows out of our relationship with God results from us believing and expressing that belief in our daily lives. It's what's called living biblically. Now here's some points that I kind of boiled this down to uh, just to kind of see how does this thing work in us. And, and we've been following this, if you want to know it, kind of from the start. Number one is understanding who God really is. Until we understand who God really is, we don't go any further than that. We have to have a God big enough to handle the whole issue of life. Number two, believing that the Bible uh, is true. It's a true representation of God's intentions. That God tells us what He wants us to know in His Word. And His intentions are woven throughout Scripture from cover to cover. Number three, expressing faith that God can be trusted in all matters of life. I have to live with a foundation. I've got a God who does all things well. He's express, expressed that to me in His Word. I need to trust Him to be that kind of God in my life. Number four, realizing there's a thread of God's purpose running throughout history. We've been dealing with that a lot. Receiving the gift of relationship which God provides through Jesus' death. Talked about that last week. Now, choosing to live according to his precepts. What are precepts? Precepts are general statements intended to regulate behavior and thought. Now, they're not just rules and regulations. It's like a higher order of that. It's like I, I'm not just trying to keep from doing wrong. I'm trying to learn to do right. 
And so I'm, I'm not marking off things on the list. I don't do that or that or that. I do these things. No, it's moving up into where there is a motivation for life driven because of God and His Word. Uh, we, we don't follow the Old Testament law. Those days are over. We live by the precepts that we discover in God's Word. David said in Psalm 103, 17, But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him, and His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep His covenant and remember His precepts to do them. That's what James said. James said, But prove yourselves doers of the Word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. See, we, we are accepting the fact that what God says is true, but we have to move from there into, I believe it has bearing upon my life and I will live according to what that truth is. I'm not just going to set the truth aside as something to, to, to study and, and learn and gain information about. I'm going to take that truth, I'm going to put it into my life, and I'm going to be transformed by it. And become a different person because that truth now has bearing upon me. We do what we believe God tells us in his word. Now, now, okay, let's go back to Moses just a minute, okay? We kind of left the story hanging there because we had had multiple times. Moses had gone up on the mountain, came down with the word of God, shared it with the people. They all agreed, we will do that. Went back up to the mountain, got word of God, came back. Same process over and over and over. After God had made clear what he expected and Moses had told the people, then Moses went up to the mountain for an extended period of time, perhaps a month or so. He went up there, and during that time, God gave him instruction about the law, the tabernacle, the social issues of, of rules and regulations for social life, and he carved out the Ten Commandments on stone. Then Moses came down from the mountain carrying the Ten Commandments. It was at that time the people were worshiping the golden calf. Now remember... They already knew that was wrong. But they had chosen to ignore God's command and revert back to their old Egyptian ways. It had just been a little over a month since they had already agreed not to do this and that they would honor all of the commandments. They didn't even make it past the first one. And 3,000 of them lost their life because of it. Now, did God expect that to happen? Yeah. Because the Bible has an interesting statement that, that Moses makes further, a little further back in the story where he says, this God is doing to test you. In other words, he's, he's, he's going to make you some commands and he really needs to see if you will accept them and do them. That's a test. It's not just saying, yep, I believe every one of those. Are we doing them? Well, no, but I believe them. I believe they're right. The test will be in whether we can take what we know is true and live it as true in our lives. Why would he have gone ahead and rescued them anyhow? If he knew they were going to do that. If he knew that he was taking a bunch of people out of Egypt honestly, that weren't going to make it into the promised land because almost all of those died in the wilderness, why would he have done that in the first place? It goes back to Exodus 2, verse 23. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died. Sons of Israel sighed because of their bondage. They cried out, and their cry for help because their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God didn't deliver them for them. He delivered them because of the promise that they were carrying that was based on the faith of those three men that formed their heritage along the way. Uh, somewhere, that God of our ancestors had to become their God. You would be surprised how many people, when we're out talking, they'll, they'll basically 
uh, skip over their life and say, yeah, I had a grandpa that was a preacher. I had an uncle that was a preacher. My grandma, boy, she was a praying woman. That has nothing to do with us today. That's them and their surrender to the Lord. What about us? What, what's driving our lives? Personalizing the fact that, yeah, the God of the covenant had to become their God and then they had to live out that covenant which required a transformed life. And that life came with requirements attached to it. And a question, will you accept these requirements? And you say, well, why, why was God so strict? I mean, he, he imposed all of these rules and regulations on them. They, they couldn't even move without having to check off a, a, a rule to see if they violated or not. Because God was taking people out of Egypt, but he had to get Egypt out of them. They had tendencies to live like what they used to be with no understanding what it meant to live like what they were, people of God. So we had to structure their life. This is the way you live. You throw these things out, you add these things in, and they began to live a patterned life. God was drawing them to a singular heart of devotion for him alone with no room for devotion to any other God. They could no longer be bi-religious, a little bit pagan, a little bit Jewish. They couldn't mix into their lives whatever they wanted and expect good results. There's an interesting story in the stories about Elisha that I want to share. 2 Kings 4, it's on the screen, verse 38. Elisha was a prophet of God, serving in the upper, the, the, the uh, northern area of, of the nation. When, when Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. As the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to a servant, Put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Then one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it a full lap of wild gourds, came and sliced them into the pot of stew, for he didn't know what they were. So they poured it out for the men to eat, and as they were eating the stew, they cried out and said, Oh man of God, there is death in this pot, and they were unable to eat. See, what he was doing, he was adding a little extra to the recipe. Things that the recipe didn't call for. And he had no idea what the effect would be because he didn't know what he was putting into it. And instead of having a, a stew that they could all enjoy and be nourished by, it made them sick. He was adding a little extra to the pot, something more pleasing, a little extra flavor, a little more texture, but what he did was make the stew unfit to eat and made it worthless. When God gives us a recipe for life, he said, don't add to it and don't take away from it because my recipe is good for you. Take it as it is. Now here's Moses. He took a nation that didn't really know God personally or know how to live in a way that pleased God and they struggled with paganism and had to be taught how to live and though he got them out of Egypt, it took time for them to get Egypt out of their hearts. To do so, they had to turn away from Egypt and turn toward God. Same for us. Paul said in Romans 12 too, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. See, the, the choice to not conform to the world must be followed by a commitment to be transformed by the precepts of the Word of God. I, I can't just say, okay, I'm going to stop being like I used to be without saying, now I'm going to be like God wants me to be. It creates a vacuum. And you know what happens in a vacuum? It will start sucking into it whatever is around it. And if it's just so close to the world that I got out of, I'll suck the world back into my life. So I, 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 I 
choose not to be conformed to the world, but to be renewed, transformed by the renewing of my mind. I am turning my back on the world, in essence, and I am turning my face toward the Lord. Now, I imagine the people coming out of Egypt thought they would just get free and relocate, never expecting a life-transforming work of God. I imagine it's the same thing for some of us. We wanted God to make us free, but we have yet to learn how to live within the freedom God's given us. So we need to move a little closer to that promised land. The further they got from Egypt, the greater the tug was to the promises God had for them in the land to come. Here are our takeaways. Number one, getting Israel out of Egypt was a matter of miracles and logistics. Getting Egypt out of Israel required transformation. It's a two-step process. Step one was removing anything that might interfere with, distract from, or replace their devotion to God. Step two was adjusting themselves to live according to the instructions God gave them. It is the same with us. All right? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for showing us in the story of Israel and the, and the Egyptians and the Exodus and the deliverance. How our lives really are reflected in that story. And what you had to do for them and in them is very much like you have to do in us. Father, thank you that the great advantage that we have over them is your spirit dwells within us. Because of that, we have an inner tug that keeps pulling us toward righteousness. They were having to make decisions. We respond. So, Father, help us to understand Again, that your call to us is not just to get out of the old life, but is to get firmly into the new life and enjoy all that you have promised for us, especially as we live according to your precepts, your words. Father, we want to be like those people and say we're in, we commit. We belong to you and we want to live for you. Father, help us to understand what that means, what we are committing to, and the transformed life you plan for each one of us. Thank you, Lord, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have your little uh, communion cup. Do you? If you don't, raise your hand. Some happy men are coming in, and we'll give you one right here. Any others that don't have your cup? All right. Perfect. Perfect. Let's turn it upside down and take out the bread. We've been talking last week and this week of, of an exchanged life. We have, we have exchanged the life of the, of the slave bound by sin to the life of freedom that can only happen when God forgives us and brings us into the family. We took it a step further by realizing that within that freedom is a requirement to keep moving toward what it is God saved us to be. When you look at the, the, the price that Jesus paid and, and the, the necessity it was for him to die to accomplish this, you realize that it was an all-in experience. He didn't just go and make a donation of blood. He gave all of his blood. His body was fully sacrificed. That's what he wants from us. A life that's fully given over to him. So as you take this, remember him and his commitment to you. Go ahead and open the juice carefully. 
You look at the juice in that same image. Jesus gave it all because he wanted all of us. He didn't limit his atonement. He didn't, he didn't portion it out, parcel it out in just small dabs here and there. He said, I give all of this for all of you if you'll respond to me. So I hope you have done so, and this is the reflection of that, and take it in remembrance of him. Wow, thank you. What a, what a lot to go on in one morning. I hope you've absorbed it. Somebody told me once, it's kind of like drinking from a fire hydrant at times, and I'm sorry I do that, but... Uh, there was a moment, Don, go ahead and get ready. There was a, a moment where I was looking at why, why God spoke to the people and they couldn't understand. And then he spoke to Moses to make sure they could understand. And I feel like most of my week is right there. God has spoken early. Here's the message. Here's where we're going. The rest of it is, okay, take this and make it where it's understandable. Make it so that they can hear this. And I had a very significant moment with the Lord over that. It was very precious to me, and I thought you needed to know it. When you go out, take this with you and uh, throw it at, I mean, uh, put it in the trash cans that are back there somewhere, all right? Uh, we got them back there by the door, Dave. Yeah, okay. Take that, or you can take it home with you if you want to. I don't care. But, uh, but it, back there would be the place to go. All right, thank you so much. Uh, um, what do you call it? Membership class, if you're interested. Doc? Uh, we're going to go out on a good note today. Uh, we thank you for coming. Our visitors, we thank you so much for coming and blessing us today. Please come back next week. When Jesus washed, oh, when Jesus washed, he washed my sins away. You guys are dismissed. God bless you. Have a blessed day. Have a blessed week. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed, oh. When Jesus washed, when Jesus washed, He washed my sins away. Oh, 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 happy day. He taught me how, how to watch, fight and pray.
Nobody's 